All right. Come, uh, welcome. I'm Andrew Natsios, the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government at Texas A&M University. And I'd like to welcome you today or this afternoon to our uh, event with our guest speaker, Luke Petty, who's written a remarkable book called um, How China Loses. Dr. Petty is a senior researcher at the Danish Institute of International Studies and a lead senior research fellow at Oxford Institute for Energy Studies at Oxford University. He's author of the book, How China Loses. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Guardian, the Hindu, Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy. He is also a regular contributor to the Wired China Chinese focused investigative business magazine. He holds a doctorate in MS and master's in so of science in, from the Copenhagen uh, Business School and a bachelor degree from Queen's University in Canada. Uh, Patey's last book was The New Kings of Crude, China, India, and the Global Struggle for Oil in Sudan and South Sudan. If you have any questions for Dr. Patey after he gives his talk, please put them in the chat and we will uh, attempt to get to them, although there are usually far more questions than we can be of time for. But join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Lou Patey. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Nasios. It's it's wonderful to to be with you, uh, and and thank you for the, the the Scowcroft Institute and the Bush School for the invitation to speak with you this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to bring up some of my slides and uh, get started. All right. Well. Uh, this afternoon, I, I want to draw on um, some of the research from my, my recent book, How China Loses, and some of the work I've been doing the last year, year and a half since, since it came out. Um, and, you know, the main message I, I, I want to do is, is, is try to unpack some of the myths I see about China's uh, power and influence in the world and add some nuance to the debate. Um, I'll focus on, on China's uh, expanding relations with Africa uh, and the Global South through uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, look at uh, the economic relations between China and Europe, and finally, uh, developments in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific region, um, where uh, we have you know, a, the, the G20 summit and, a, and an important meeting between uh, President Biden and President Xi Jinping uh, just, just uh, today. So the common conclusion I, I, I hope you'll take on after you know, I, I unpack some of these very large themes is that to understand China's rise in the world um, and where it might be going in the future in terms of its power and influence, it's key to really move beyond uh, a preoccupation with the uh, focus on the US-China rivalry alone and move towards uh, understanding China's rise as also contingent on relations with the rest of the world. So many of the uh, me leading media sources out there uh, often re reduce China's rise um, to the rivalry uh, between China and the U.S. And as a result, you know the, the China-U.S. rivalry is is seen as a as a point of contention that is shaping global politics and the global economy without much focus on, on the rest of the world. And so one of the efforts I try to do in my book is sort of widen our vantage point, uh, particularly uh, for audiences in the US and Europe towards China's uh, uh, relations with, with, other, with other powers. Now, this is not to say that the US-China relationship isn't uh, essential. Um, it is clearly the most important bilateral relationship in the world. The two countries make up 40% of the global economy. They have the two most powerful militaries in the world. They have uh, impressive technological capabilities. But I think we also tend to lose sight of the other 60% of the world economy, the other military powers, tech leaders, cultural hubs that are shaping global issues, such as addressing and, and, and preparing for climate change, the direction of free trade, uh, how new technologies are going to shape our societies. 
And so what I try to do in the book is put a spotlight on these relationships and to show that there's a diversity of power out there. There's a diversity of economic wealth, of technological capabilities um, that we need to understand in order to understand uh, indeed where China is headed in the future. So this isn't to say that you know, China is not a significant power, um, but it is to say that perhaps its, its rise and its dominance won't be as uh, strong as, as some predict. Um, and when we do look at, at, at China's relationship around the world, we see that it's had some fraying relations with Europe, uh, with some of its uh, big neighbors in Asia, and that these um, are, are partly the cause of a more assertive, sometimes aggressive foreign policy, primarily under uh, Xi Jinping since uh, he came to power in China in 2012. And that this more assertive foreign policy has elicited a pushback from, from other powers beyond just the United States alone. So I'm not arguing that, that China should not or, or does not have influence in the world or that the US will necessarily retain its, its strong position in global politics and the global economy. But I hope my book does show that, that China's relationships are under strain and that it is undermining some of its own interests uh, through this foreign policy that it's maintained at least for the last decade or so. So let's begin um, with what is probably the, uh, the most important uh, foreign policy uh, initiative by China uh, over the last 10 years, and that is the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the Belt and Road is Xi Jinping's project of the century. It's a, a massive undertaking of hundreds of billions of dollars in finance and investment, largely going towards uh, building new infrastructure around the world, but mainly in, in the global South, Africa, Latin America, but across developing Asia as well. Uh, it's more than infrastructure as well. It's trying to open up new industrial corridors, uh, develop new manufacturing links, trade agreements, uh, technology standards for um, fostering new political and cultural cooperation. Everything is under this sort of belt and road tent. And it extends across the Euro-Asia Euro landscape, um, in, across the maritime regions of the Pacific and Indian Ocean, and e even into East Africa and Latin America. Now, when we hear uh, about uh, the Belt and Road in, in American debates, but also debates here in Europe, we often have uh, two positions. Um, one of those positions sees the Belt and Road as a debt trap, as um, an effort by Beijing to deliberately uh, ensnare its partners in large levels of, of loans in order to, through those loans, itself capture these strategic assets such as ports or railways. Um, we also, however, uh, have a view of the Belt and Road as a more benign instrument, uh, just business, a commercial initiative without many um, geopolitical or strategic objectives. So what I propose is we're having the wrong debate um, and that us in, in Europe, but also in um, in, in the United States should be, uh, sorry, should be focusing on uh, the impact that the Belt and Road has on development and that this will largely shape uh, China's influence and legitimacy in the global South in the long run. So China's not wrong uh, to be uh, focusing on infrastructure. Uh, the, the, the global South uh, is in desperate need of, of infrastructure investments. Africa, for example, has a gap of, of $100 billion um, a year in, in annual infrastructure. Um, Asia has an annual gap of $1.7 trillion. So there's plenty of room uh, and need for infrastructure uh, across the global South. And for this reason, China has gained uh, a lot of, of uh, positive relations across the global south for its infrastructure investments. Um, just give me a second. 
But at the same time, uh, the Belt and Road is facing um, some challenges, some development challenges um, that that I think are undermining its its long term uh, legitimacy as an as an initiative. Now we often hear about uh, select countries like Sri Lanka that have taken on large levels of Chinese loans, which have pushed up their debt levels, uh, which are mostly based uh, from, from Western lenders that have overflowed flowed those debt levels uh, to the point that they've entered debt distress, that their economic assets uh, are, can't pay, no longer pay for the levels of debt they're taking on. And this leads to these sort of debt trap discussions that we have uh, in the United States and Europe. Uh, currently 60% some estimates show that 60% of the projects um, of the Belt and Road are in debt distressed countries. Uh, and that's a massive increase from uh, uh, the levels that uh, they, we saw uh, around 10 years ago. But I think there are some sort of inherent qualities um, in, the, in the Belt and Road that also limit uh, the ability of China uh, to really have a strong developmental impact in its partner countries. So I'll go through this list. Um, first, um, the Belt and Road, uh, you know, large parts of it are, are building new infrastructure, roads, railways, ports, hydropower dams. But the, the vast majority of, of those projects are condi conditioned to the use of Chinese contractors, Chinese companies, but also Chinese products, exports that come into the country to build the infrastructure. And that naturally has the, the impact of crowding out uh, local players from crowding out local industries much more than, for instance, World Bank projects are doing. Um, and this really undermines uh, from the outset the, the ability for local industries uh, and local companies to gain from this new finance. Second, um, it's important to keep in mind that although, as I noted, infrastructure is, is important for development, Infrastructure alone does not lead to economic development. Uh, and China is, is, a, is a prime example of that. Um, you know, China uh, has plenty of fascinating, uh, fantastic infrastructure for those of you have, that have visited it. It has high speed rails, uh, ways throughout the country. Um, but much of its infrastructure uh, is not generating productive economic activity. And China can afford um, to a certain degree, uh, to have this infrastructure in place and for its people to benefit from it. But we already see that much of this infrastructure is now causing the Chinese economy to slow down because it overinvested uh, in, 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 this, in, this, in these projects, and that's dragging down the growth of the economy. Other countries don't have the same borrowing capacities as China, um, and that even you know a number of, of large-scale infrastructure projects that don't pan out, that don't generate new trade, that don't generate new business, they, they tend to drag down the economies much quicker. Uh, African countries don't have the same capacity to take on loans as China. Even the African Development Bank is, is now pointing out that, that its members need to make very smart and timely decisions on infrastructure because of their limited capacities. Thirdly, what's not happening with the Belt and Road uh, so far is we're not seeing a, a large offshoring of, of jobs leaving China, as some experts have predicted, and going to diff different regions around the world, Africa, Latin America in particular. There are, of course, some uh, Chinese companies that are uh, going out, that are investing um, in, particularly in Southeast Asia and Asia, as labor costs and in China rise. But we're not seeing large amounts heading into East Africa, heading across the African continent or to Latin America or to large parts of Asia. Um, and this just builds on the, the troubles that this inf these infrastructure projects have uh, in, in not building the, the kind of product productive activity um, that's necessary for development. So there are some positive cases, um, but there, there is also uh, a lot of long-term concerns uh, if this infrastructure doesn't generate uh, um, this type of economic productive activity um, that, that one hopes it, it could have. So we see um, 
some of the results of, of the Belt and Road um, in, in recent years, we see a, a, a drastic drop in finance uh, that, um, in, that China is, is providing. Um, and this is sort of a, both, I think, a, a, a consequence of, of China's uh, lending capacity uh, beginning to, to sort of uh, uh, fizzle out, but also recognition from officials in Beijing that some, many of their loans were, were made, were risky bets, and that they're sort of taking a step back and, and reworking their, their objectives for the Belt and Road Initiative. So in recent years, we've seen, you know, very small levels of, of loans and finance coming to Africa and Latin America in particular. Uh, much of it is being now focused around China in Southeast Asia and Central Asia, and focused on building those immediate benefits for the Chinese economy as well. So the Belt and Road is in, in, in a stage of being reworked, uh, redesigned in Beijing. Uh, I don't think it's down, it's, it's not out at the moment, um, but uh, we will probably see a, the, the rebirth of it in the coming years, perhaps uh, a small, smaller initiatives, but still uh, uh, focused on perhaps green, green investments and, and, other, um, and other, other sectors. So I, I wanted to, you know, explore uh, a little bit on top of the Belt and Road to look at China's Africa engagement, um, because I think it's important to to both recognize the strengths uh, and achievements that China's made in its expanding engagement in Africa, but also to see those limitations uh, and see the diversity of Africa's trade relationship. So you may have seen um, graphs like this one before sort of demonstrating ch China's drastic uh, and strong trade growth in Africa. Um, even in, in 2021, uh, it has grown again to go above $250 billion. Um, much of this trade mirrors the trade of, of Western countries with Africa, that it's focused mainly on, on uh, importing oil and, and minerals from, from African countries into China and exporting value-added consumer products, machinery, and, elect and electronics. Um, we also you know, can see this graph, and, and the red line is, is showing China's uh, investment flows into Africa and how they are outpacing the US quite strongly in, over the past decade. So China has very much demonstrated a strong economic growth in Africa. Uh, on top of these sort of top line figures, China is also becoming more engaged in the African uh, technology scene. Uh, the mobile phone maker, for, exa for example, Transian um, holds you know, over 40% of, of the market uh, in, across the continent. Uh, China is involved in artificial intelligence in Africa. Chinese telecom companies, Huawei and, and ZTE have a strong presence on the continent as well. So it, it's, it's no surprise that uh, Africans in this recent Afrobarometer poll of, of 34 African countries uh, see China as a positive external influence, uh, even slightly more so uh, than the United States, uh, because it's brought new infrastructure, new trade, new investment, uh, new technology engagement to the continent. Um, however, you know, th the same African countries um, still point towards uh, the U.S. development model, so democracy as as their primary sort of uh, guide uh, moving forward. And I think this reveals that uh, African countries, like most countries in the global South, still want to engage a variety of foreign partners. Um, and in, in fact, I think there is a, a tendency to even exaggerate um, China's role in Africa. And, I, and I'll show you why. Um, firstly, China's growth um, in trade has been remarkable with Africa over the past two decades. But even, uh, um, even though that's taken place, the EU still is um, Africa's largest trading partner, uh, the 27 countries of the European Union. Um, and they, the EU is, st is actually still a, a smaller economy than China, but it still out outpaces China in trade with Africa, despite uh, China's, uh, China's growth. So the, the continent has a, a more diverse trading portfolio than, than many people might think. The same goes for investment. Um, 
we rarely hear about uh, British or Italian uh, investment growth in Africa in our newspapers and magazines. But those two countries have been uh, not only having higher, uh, sorry, have been growing faster uh, than the Chinese in terms of investment in the continent. And China is among um, many investors on the African continent, uh, number five in terms of total F foreign direct investment stock. Another, um, I think, exaggeration we make is about uh, the, the technology uh, role of China and Africa. And, and this is sort of just a, a small example of, of that. Um, now, it, foreign policy, uh, uh, the, 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 a magazine, the American uh, foreign policy magazine, um, in, in 2019 published an article um, quoting someone who, who remarked that 70% of the continents, uh, African continents, uh, mobile networks, four, fourth generation mobile networks are uh, being built by, by Huawei, the Chinese telecom giant, uh, leaving its European rivals in the dust. Um, and the way these things work is that that foreign policy article uh, is then referenced in uh, other uh, uh, research and reporting, such as the Atlantic Council, uh, Voice of America, uh, Deutsche Welle here in Europe. And this idea that Huawei dominates the African uh, mobile network market uh, really spreads quite rapidly among journalists, researchers, policymakers, politicians. And this sort of fits this, this picture that Huawei, this sort of light blue uh, line, has been growing quite steadily uh, in its market shares uh, ac across the globe um, in, in, in over the past couple of decades to become quite a strong uh, competitor to, to European and American telecom companies. Um, the reality, however, is when we break it down into regions, um, both uh, Nokia and Ericsson, which are European telecom companies, still have higher market shares in every region of the world except Asia than Huawei and ZTE, the other Chinese telecom company, put together. So the point here is not that Huawei actually doesn't matter. Huawei is an important player uh, in, in Africa's um, telecom uh, industry. But the European players are still very strong in every region of the global south. Um, and Huawei's position in, in global rankings uh, tends to be elevated by the fact that it maintains a dominant share in its home economy, um, where China represents uh, the largest uh, telecom market in the world. So this is to say that European and other foreign actors still play a strong role in, in, in many aspects of, of Africa's uh, technology development. Here are even the new um, contracts that are being signed for the fifth generation of mobile networks. Nokia and Ericsson across most regions are, are outpacing uh, Huawei uh, and ZTE. So what can we take um, from this sort of diverse picture of, of the relationships uh, between China and the global South. I think first there are, there are indeed lessons to be learned uh, from China's engagement in the global South. Um, China, unlike I think many Western countries, views the global South as a market, as a future uh, uh, and current, current and future consumer market um, with high population growth potential and therefore high consumer growth potential. Uh, and I think some European countries and companies get this, but this is, I think is something that the US in particular can actually take on and learn from, from its Chinese uh, rivals in, in, in Africa. But at the same time, um, I think most countries in the global South are, are not particularly interested to be solely in a Chinese orbit. They want to have uh, diverse partners uh, they want to have uh, many uh, uh, investment investors coming in. Um, it's not solely uh, a, a sort of a Chinese run show in Africa or the global South. I think diversity prevails and that's what most countries want it to be. They, they want balance in their, in their foreign uh, policy relationships. So let's move on to Europe um, where one of the narratives that is often presented 
um, is that uh, Europe has an economic dependency on China that places uh, Brussels uh, and other uh, foreign capitals in Europe in a constrained position in responding to strategic and geopolitical differences with Beijing. But I think we need to, again, scrutinize this, this narrative a little uh, deeper and come to the understanding that the only uh, place that the European is economically dependent on is actually the European Union. It represent, you know, China is, a, is an important trading partner to Europe, of course, just as the US is. Uh, China is, you know, represents a fifth of the global economy. It has a sizable portion of, of, of global growth each year. Um, it's an important economic partner to the EU, but it alone, uh, this alone doesn't make the EU broadly dependent on, on China. So let me explain this in, in a couple graphs. Um, this graph shows the growth in trade uh, with China and the US and the EU, the 27 countries of the European Union over the past decade or so. And we can see both, both China and the US are growing quite strongly. Uh, European officials often boast that uh, there's 1.9 billion euros traded with China each day. Um, and we can see in, in 2021, China even surpasses, sorry, in 2020, China even surpasses the EU, or sorry, the US as the largest uh, trading partner for, for the EU. Um, that's a little bit deceptive. If you count services in trade, the, the US is still number one, but China is nonetheless becoming more important to the EU's uh, trading relationship. But China's trade growth with the EU needs to be taken in the context of the EU's broader trade relationships. So just as officials in Brussels boast of 1.9 billion euros traded every year uh, uh, with China, the EU uh, also trades $30 billion with the world uh, each day. Um, so when we take the entire EU trading relationship into context, the graph uh, changes to look like this, where the green line represents the internal trade within the European Union. And the lines in the bottom, which include China and the US and other foreign partners, sort of you know, fade into the background of importance uh, because they still only represent small percentages. Uh, the EU internal trade represents 60% of uh, on average uh, of the trade of, of European countries. So there is actually a low trade dependency on China in the European Union, uh, only around 6% in 2021. Um, even, even Europe's uh, largest trading partner with, with China, Germany, um, it trades 9.5% of its uh, trade is with China. But it has a very, nonetheless, it has a very diverse trading portfolio with the United States, France, Poland, uh, the Netherlands, each having around five to eight percent of, of German uh, total German trade. Even where growth is concerned, um, it hasn't been China that has been sort of uh, exploding past everyone else in trade growth. Again, it's the European Union that that really generates the the vast majority of trade growth for, for the EU. Um, even in investment, uh, it's, it's increasingly a narrow group of European multinationals that are invested in China, led by uh, German automakers like Volkswagen, uh, Daimler, uh, Daimler and, and Mercedes-Benz. And, and we, this sort of scope of investment into into uh, China from the EU is becoming more and more narrowly focused on the automobile sector and a few others. But there are dependencies. Um, and, and one of the dependencies comes from that narrow scope of, of multinationals. Um, so for example, the, the leading companies uh, in Germany on its top stock exchange, the DAX, have on average 16% of their sales in China. Um, so there are companies like Volkswagen uh, or, or Siemens or BASF or Adidas um, that have these sort of high sales volumes in China that they don't want to lose um, if, if, in, if there are to be sort of geopolitical differences 
uh, that upset uh, the, their operations there. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, the interests of European multinationals, just like the interests of Western or of American or Japanese or Korean multinationals, their foreign investments in China and elsewhere don't necessarily translate into um, economic welfare for the average uh, German or American or Canadian back home, uh, particularly when it's made into China, an economy that is, is really trying to capture most of the uh, benefits of that foreign investment to, to, to get new technologies through joint ventures um, and to really uh, build domestic competitors for those companies over the long run. So we have to keep in mind that a lot of the corporate interests in China don't necessarily line up well with the uh, national interests of, of European countries. But there are also some supply vulnerabilities that the EU faces, uh, just as the US does. Um, so supplies of, of products Hard. such as processed oh. rare earths that are essential for green and, and, and critical uh, technologies that the EU and others will need to try to sort of lower their dependencies over time. But by and large, the, the dependencies are very much focused on, on, on a small group of multinationals and uh, a, a set of, of supplies and, and goods uh, coming into the EU. Now, this isn't to say that all European companies are extremely dependent on China. I, I've done a study on, on the Swedish telecom giant Ericsson, which is uh, a huge player in the United States in building the fifth generation mobile networks and building fourth generation mobile networks with operators like Verizon. And here what's striking is its sales in China uh, peaked in the early 2000s and really have stagnated since. And it's been actually the United States, the blue line there, that has represented its boom market because its, its main competitor, Huawei, has not had uh, many significant activities in the US over the past decade or so. The same is, is partly true for the Danish wind turbine manufacturer, Vestas. Uh, China only represents 6% of its uh, accumulative uh, wind power capacity. So it's, it's, it's operations around the world that it's built out new turbines. Um, that's, that's a considerable amount, but it, it's really quite small when you consider that China is by far the largest uh, wind uh, uh, industry, has by far the largest wind industry in the world. So it's not a major market for Vestas. Um, in fact, it's the new uh, uh, capacity that Vestas has been building out uh, in China in the last five years is very similar to what it was doing over 10 years ago, even though the Chinese market has grown substantially since. Uh, last year, China only represented 1% of, of uh, or sorry, Vestas represented 1% of, China, of China's market. So uh, not all multinationals are, are strongly dependent on, on the Chinese market. So the last myth I wanted to unpack um, this afternoon, um, it, I'll do so briefly, and, and it has to do with, with Asia. And this is, I think, one you, you hear quite regularly that uh, particularly coming out of, of Beijing, but also out of, of media sources around the world, is that the US is orchestrating uh, a coalition to counter China and, uh, uh, and contain China uh, within Asia. Now, there's certainly some truth to this. Uh, of course, the US has been launching sanctions uh, against China, sanctioning it most recently its, its semiconductor industry, sanctioning companies from engaging in the Chinese market in that sector um, under President Biden. Under President Trump, uh, the, the US uh, also was sanctioning uh, Huawei and other Chinese telecom companies to, to cut off their uh, international expansion. And in both of these uh, projects, Washington has been pushing its allies to join it uh, in on these measures. But at the same time, I think this, this is a myth because there are other countries uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific region, in Asia, um, that have their own grievances um, with China, that there are multiple sources of, of animosity that has been built up in China's uh, regional relations. Uh, and, and that other countries have actually taken on leadership roles or initiator roles in some of this pushback against China. 
It hasn't only been the US. So let me give you some examples. First, Australia. Um, I think many people aren't, aren't aware, but Australia was in fact uh, quicker to, to ban Huawei uh, within its mobile networks than the United States was uh, by, by banning Huawei already back in, in 2012, um, before the US did so officially under President Obama in 2014. Uh, Australia has also been a key driver of the uh, interna international diplomacy to, to form, uh, to, to, to have multiple countries not use Huawei in their networks. Um, another example uh, that Australia is sort of leading by is this sort of passing a foreign interference law um, in, to ensure that uh, Chinese interference, uh, Chinese sponsorship of, of politicians um, happens, uh, does not happen in, in, their, in their politics. Um, and that's something that other countries have been looking towards uh, copying and, and learning from. Uh, another example is Japan. Japan is probably one of the most significant examples, uh, I think, because already um, back in the early 2000s, when the United States was was quite preoccupied with its uh, um, with its uh, invasions of, of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Japan was quite worried that the U.S. would take its eye off of Asia and that they would have to deal with a rising China on their own. So Tokyo, all the way back in 2007. Um, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe uh, visited New Delhi, India, uh, really seeking to foster new economic, political, and defense ties, and really helped to spark what we now know as the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, the Quad for short, which is a security and defense partnership involving uh, Japan, India, uh, the United States, and Australia. Japan also uh, picked up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this trade agreement, um, uh, across uh, Asia after uh, President Trump abandoned the agreement and, and kept it alive uh, uh, under uh, uh, new circumstances. Japan has also been a leader in demonstrating uh, how to lower dependencies on China when it comes to, to those rare earths uh, in, in, that are critical for, for green and, and other technologies. So Japan has, has played a leadership role as well. Southeast Asia um, has not been really pushing strongly back against China, but it's another example of where there's a diversity of power. So China is the largest trading partner in the region, but the U.S. Uh, continues to be the largest investor uh, across Southeast Asia. And even though China has the Belt and Road, Japan continues to be the largest financer of infrastructure in the region. I think most significantly pushback has come from India. Um, so before uh, their fighting along the Himalayan border, uh, China and India back in June 2020, there were warming ties between New Delhi and Beijing. But after that, that brief conflict, um, India has, has banned Huawei uh, and other tech companies uh, from its, from its uh, markets, including uh, Chinese apps like TikTok are not allowed to be used in India. Uh, India went deeply into the quad and, and is partnering with it. So this is really, a, I think, a, a drawback for the Chinese um, to not be engaged in, in the Indian economy and in the Indian tech industry as much as they, they could be. And we see this in, in venture capital investments from the China in India since, since the conflict in 2020. The, uh, the Americans in particular, uh, American investors have gained from the uh, uh, smaller presence of, of Chinese venture capitalists in, in the Indian tech industry. So I, I just want to you know, conclude by, by pointing out, we often see these Pew Research graphs of, of uh, mostly Western countries uh, across Europe, the US, Canada, having uh, less favorable views of China over the recent years. This is also true among some of China's larger neighbors, uh, including uh, most notably countries like India, uh, but also countries you might not think of, uh, like Indonesia and Philippines. Um, and this, even if these governments in Southeast Asian countries uh, want to have uh, positive relations with China, they're going to have to balance this against the, the unfavorable views that their populations uh, see China in. So in conclusion, um, I hope that I, I've demonstrated that there are relationships out there that we need to keep an eye on uh, when it comes to China.
because they really also give us a sense for China's power and influence in the world. Um, by no means, um, you know, should you know China be be isolated and, and contained. I don't think a, a broad scale decoupling is is uh, what anyone is calling for. But I, I hope if we start to understand some of these relationships, uh, to understand what China's power and influence really is, um, then we can sort of find areas where there is the need for selective decoupling and areas where there's need for more competition uh, against China, and then areas where there's need for cooperation. Um, and so it's important for the US to know, I think, where to push back against China, uh, what its allies and partners might think about China um, to, if it really wants to, to uh, uh, manage its, its future relationship with Beijing. Thanks for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fady. Very, very interesting. I have, uh, let me start with a few questions of my own, and then if people can uh, uh, ask questions in the chat, well, I'll, I'll try to get to them if I can find them here. <laughs> Uh, the, the first thing I would raise, you haven't, in your presentation at least, dealt with the issue of demography. Some uh, things are changeable. They, you know, the Chinese could take action and they, when they see a problem, because they have a centralized bureaucracy and, and they used to have large cash reserves, now they have large debts, but they still have uh, capacity to act when there's a problem. Uh, one thing they can't change is demography. Because uh, it's it, it uh, because of the one-child policy, there uh, the projections are now that with by the end of this century, may maybe much sooner, China will have fifty percent fewer people than it does now, and a large percentage of those will be elderly people who, who don't buy a lot and can't work anymore, and that reduction in population would would be from one point four billion to seven hundred million. And some people have argued that this would make them more aggressive now because Xi Jinping now is worried about this because they've lifted the limit on the size of families. Uh, women can only have children up to a certain age and then they can't have them anymore. And there's a, a limit to the number of children any woman can have just because of how long it takes uh, to have a child. Um, and so it, this cannot be easily changed. Um, could you comment on that a little bit? Because it's going to affect economic growth. It'll also profoundly affect the, 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 mar the internal market that China, that all advanced economies get, as you pointed out, with respect to the European Union, which is also true uh, in the United States and in Canada and Australia and Japan. But most of our um, jobs and most of our trade is internal. Um, and the most important thing is how big your your, your, your trading partners are internally. And one of the things that, that President Bush 41 was visionary in is creating the North American Tree Free Trade Agreement that creates a, a body uh, or a market of 500 million people in North America. The same thing is true for the European Union. Uh, and now this, this trade agreement in Asia would do the same thing. Can you comment a little bit on this demography problem and how that affects economic growth? and whether this challenge, uh, how China can deal with this challenge. Yeah, it's an excellent point. I mean, rising debt levels, um, and secondly, the, the, the aging population uh, challenge that, that China faces are, are really, I think, two of the main drags on its economy. Um, and I think the, the latter one, the, the demography issue, uh, is, is going to be near impossible uh, to reverse. Um, and I think, you know, this, you know, points out uh, um, something I think that's, that's quite interesting. Um, we've had, you know, on the topic of myths, right, uh, it's often been argued that authoritarian governments uh, like those in China uh, can't produce uh, innovative uh, uh, sectors, innovative companies. Um, we've seen that partly to be untrue with China, that China has been able to, um, to a certain extent. At the same time, uh, we're, we're often told that authoritarian governments like China uh, have the capacity uh, to think in the long term, unlike a democracy uh, where, where governments might be changing every four or five years after elections, um, where there's more volatility in political views. 
But I think the, the one child policy, the aging population demonstrates that authoritarian governments, um, even with more time on their hands, still make colossal mistakes in their, in their planning and thinking. Uh, and that um, we see a, a potential re repeat of that with, this, with China's uh, COVID zero policy um, that they've been uh, to date uh, not uh, stopping the, this very sort of tight restrictions on their population uh, when there are very few cases of COVID in, in cities and towns and regions. And this continues uh, now for, for several years. Um, uh, the same issue goes with, with the vaccination programs in China. Uh, strikingly, um, China's, particularly its elderly population, uh, those who are, are most prone to the virus, um, are not vaccinated. Um, that there is just this uh, rejection of vaccinations. Um, and all, all these challenges um, are dragging down economic growth in the short term uh, and, 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 and in the long term as well with the demography problem. Um, I don't have a, a, a strong sense for, for what, what is needed for China to reverse this beyond um, uh, increasing uh, birth rates. Um, but uh, as I think you alluded to, uh, uh, there are sort of uh, concerns that um, that China may, might see that its window of, of relative uh, power increases in the world is closing as these economic uh, challenges with debt and the aging population uh, tighten up. And there's, there's concerns that this, this will push Beijing to act on some of its uh, global aims, such as uh, reunifying China uh, uh, through the potential military invasion of Taiwan. Um, there are others who will argue the opposite, that because China is weakening at home, it will not want to take the risk of in invading the Taiwan, the very you know, uh, large risk of doing such a, a maritime invasion, um, because it could lead to a catastrophe which will undermine the legitimacy and the power of, of, the, of the party. So these, these I think, long-term economic challenges with debt and with, with the aging population um, I don't think we in, in the West have a, a perfect reading on how they are really affecting Chinese uh, policymaking. Uh, and it is getting, it's become even more difficult to do so because of COVID, because we haven't been visiting China, um, but also because political conditions in China are making it very difficult for, for journalists and researchers that, it, that are working there to understand what's going on. So we're operating increasingly in, I think, in a, in a black box or at least a uh, a, a, an information vacuum where we don't know the thinking on China. Uh, um, we don't know the thinking of Chinese leaders and Chinese policymakers like we, we used to. And even then, that was, a, a, I think, a very sort of narrow scope um, at that time as well. So um, these are long-term challenges, um, and, and they're going to push China. I, I just don't know which direction they're going to push them in. Yeah, certainly understandable, given the, the uh secrecy of the of, of totalitarian regimes generally, but specifically of China. Um, recently, the United Nations Human Rights Council voted not to debate China's genocide, according to some people of the Uyghur population, the Muslim Turks of uh, 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 East Turkestan. Can you speak to China's using its economic growth to influence international norms? And this is an issue that's been brought up by a lot of people, does admitting illegal illiberal regimes into liberal institution risk illiberalizing those institutions? Yeah, it's a great question and a, and a complex one. Um, I think China, of course, as, as I you know, tried to, to, to show in, in, in different ways, has improved its, its ties across the global south. Um, and, and many scholars are now arguing in, 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 in Africa, uh, for example, it's no longer about uh, economics and trade and investment. That's important for Beijing. It's about securing that uh, political support from, from 50 plus African countries uh, in UN votes on issues such as Xinjiang. Um, that it, with that political support, they are, they are sure to keep these issues yes. away from, from any sort of strong, uh, broad international action. So uh, I think it's important to note that yes, China's economic uh, engagement uh, with these with countries across the global south does win it win it friends but at the same time if you look at the voting patterns 
of particularly African countries uh, on these human rights issues in the past, they did tend to not follow what the United States and Western countries, how they were voting. So these trends are, are, are being reinforced by, I think, China's wishes, but they were trends that were there uh, before. Um, and this is, this is sort of a key, I think, venue that uh, the United Nations and, and human rights that I think the United States um, for some years hasn't put enough attention towards uh, uh, managing its influence within the UN. Um, but I think if the US uh, along with the EU uh, does put more attention there, put more money there, put more interest in, in managing uh, these multilateral organizations, um, they can get, gain traction in their policy aims. We've seen several uh, UN organizations where, um, uh, such as the Intellectual Property Organization, uh, where a, a Chinese leadership has been proposed and, and a united front uh, led by the US and the EU and other yeah. Western countries has managed to vote down that leadership in these really critical areas. But yes, I mean, human rights, um, the Human Rights Council, uh, its membership um, includes many countries with very negative human rights track records um, in China, China, Middle Eastern countries and elsewhere. So it's, um, this is a key arena of, of I think, uh, ideological um, uh, struggle between, uh, between uh, those who, who want to see an advancement of international human rights and uh, views in China, which would like to see uh, um, collective uh, state-led uh, positions um, be more um, uh, dominant in, in these venues rather than uh, individual rights. What is the prognosis for a common EU orientation and policy toward China? We see the German chancellor in uh, Beijing meeting with Xi Jinping because they're worried about uh, German exports, uh, but that's just Germany. I mean, that's not the EU. And, and um, each country seems to have different challenges in the European Union in their bilateral relationship with China. As you know, uh, China, um, went after, I think it was Latvia, or one of the Baltic states, because they had said something they didn't like. And, and the, this very, very, very relatively small country uh, was challenging China, I think very successfully. It was a very brave for the thing for them to do, but did all of the European, other European countries condemn China for what they did to, I think it was to Latvia uh, when they raised these human rights issues? Yes, um, great question. Uh, the Europe, you know, Europe is not all on the same page. The European countries aren't on the same page when it comes relation to relationship to the relationship with China. Um, I think it, it's you can look at it uh, in two ways. Um, you know, defensively, uh, Europe has improved, I think, or enhanced its 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 um, economic defenses against China. So um, we've seen. Uh, the passing of a, a, a an EU investment screening law, which uh, allows shines more light on um, uh, acquisitions by Chinese companies and other foreign companies of European companies, and as a result of that, we've seen uh, a number of investments blocked by by European uh, countries, Italy, Germany, and others. Some investments still go through. There was a recent. Uh, uh, stake in a, in a terminal at, at the Hamburg port in Germany that a Chinese company bought into. But many investments, uh, particularly in, in, in technologies, uh, military uh, applied technologies are being blocked. Um, we also see uh, recently a new anti-subsidy law that's been passed by the EU, which will basically mean uh, when it is uh, implemented uh, that uh, companies, for instance, from China, but also elsewhere outside of the European Union who benefit from subsidies at home Will, will not be allowed into uh, procurement projects uh, and other investments in the European Union. Um, we also see the development of an anti-coercion instrument. Um, in, in the coming weeks, this should be released by, by the, uh, the European Union in the coming weeks or months. Um, and this gets to, the, to your example. Uh, the country was Lithuania. And Lithuania, um, I think it was last year, opened up a Taiwanese representative office in its capital in Vilnius. Um, and this uh, was to, to do what many countries do around the world, to have a representative office uh, of Taiwan uh, 
uh, to facilitate trade and cultural relations. The only difference was the name itself. Um, most of these uh, offices are called, uh, you know, the Taipei uh, uh, office, um, naming the capital of Taiwan instead of giving it sort of a, a, a national uh, signification. Um, so China reacted uh, quite uh, negatively, negatively to that uh, that uh, uh, um, act, and and basically cut off trade uh, between uh, Lithuania and China by removing Lithuania from its customs registry, uh, and also calling on European companies that invested in Lithuania that they may not be allowed to invest in China in the future if they maintain their their investments in the, in that small uh, Baltic state. Now, the consequence of that actually, I think, helped to rally European countries uh, together. Um, we, uh, it, it sped up the process of the anti-coercion instrument being developed, which will allow the EU to hit China or even the United States or another foreign power with, with economic measures should they uh, try to coerce a European member state. Um, we've seen those companies that have been targeted by uh, China not leave Lithuania. Uh, in fact, uh, paradoxically, Lithuania has benefited from some companies, uh, European companies leaving Russia after Russia's invasion of Ukraine to relocate in Lithuania. Um, so we've seen these sort of strange results and, and, and it, it's led to, I think, a, a, a deeper uh, understanding of, of the importance of the common market uh, for Europeans, that if these investments are being distorted because China is upset with a political decision, um, then everyone in the common market will hurt will will be hurt. Um, but that's not to say that uh, there are there aren't differences. Uh, we Germany, uh, you know, as I've written about recently, Germany is quite keen on advancing the the interests of of its automobile industry. And those companies like Volkswagen see China as a as a critical investment destination. Um, so China is still able to to play this divide and rule. Uh, between European member states and to to go to Berlin instead of going to Brussels where the where the European Commission uh, is headquartered uh, and to try to 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 pull out these differences and and to, to make sure that Europe is is not as united as as it could possibly be because a united Europe um, is a is a you know 14 16 trillion dollar economy um, that that will have a you know quite a strong influence in global affairs but uh, I I an EU that can't get its act together, that has France and Germany going in different directions on China, is a much better animal uh, to deal with for the Chinese. Um, one of the uh, issues that is not well known uh, was uh, research in a book called Invisible China by Scott Rizel, who heads the Rural China Institute at Stanford and his colleague, Natalie Hell. And, um, we had him on last year. By the way, our, our all of our uh, our programs, our talks, whether they're in person or by by Zoom or uh, some other platform, are recorded and then we post them to the Scowcroft Institute website at the Bush School. We did note when we did when we did that for Invisible China that the uh, somehow the the uh, Zoom conversation got corrupted and it wasn't an accident. The Chinese apparently did not like. And Scott Rosell is not a China basher at all. It's a very interesting book. One of the things he says in it is that no country has moved from middle income status to upper income status without increasing dramatically the percentage of the population that has a high school education. China has the lowest percentage of its population with a high school degree of any of the middle income countries in the world. I was quite surprised by that. They have a, a vocational education program to develop people with certain skills, and it is, uh, it's, it's not a serious undertaking. He, he went through a lot of data on that. So, and, and there are also micronutrient problems that he talks about, uh, high infection rates, children sleeping in class because they have iron deficiencies. It was, uh, it was quite fascinating. And I think the Chinese can probably work on those. Those are alterable. Uh, reformable uh, weaknesses, but, but they're weaknesses nevertheless. The last thing I would uh, just say is Douglas North is probably the most revered development economist among aid agencies, bilateral and multilateral. If you went to the World Bank or USAID or the European Union, 
they'd say Douglas North is one of the great minds uh, of the last century on development, along with Marty Ascent. And um, Douglas North said that China will hit a stone wall, not for ideological reasons, but because it has weak institutions. It has a few strong institutions like the Communist Party, but in terms of the rule of law and all of these other um, matrices of institutions and standards that, that allow a country to become highly productive, China does not have that. China was trying to reverse that into Hu Jintao by building law schools and courts. They're actually allowing uh, lawsuits between uh, Chinese companies. Xi Jinping has reversed that, which I, I'm just astonished he did that. Either he doesn't, uh, is not aware of this research, but uh, could you comment on the issue of, of institutions and accountable institutions? Is this new technology where they, they have a rating for everybody and uh, is that gonna replace uh, Douglas North's notion of, of institutions? Uh, fascinating subjects, um, which you know I, I can't uh, you know engage at the same level as as, as uh, those authors. But um, I think you know I think firstly that Xi Jinping does recognize the the, the risk, uh, including for the power, the future power of the Communist Party, in high levels of inequality in China. Um, now acting on that. Uh, through you know what what he calls uh, com, you know building common prosperity is is easier said than done um as you as you point out uh these sort of huge discrepancies between the rural populations and and those in the city uh you know cities and 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 sort of these these hubs in different parts of china have very high level uh, uh of high levels of wealth comparable to to uh, the the us uh, and and it advanced economies in Europe as well, um, but much of the population uh, is 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 still low income. Um, uh, much of the population is very close to the poverty line, uh, and that is a, a major challenge. I think that the that the Communist Party recognizes for its own legitimacy in the long run, um, but also for it uh, sustaining its 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 global power and influence. And and getting out of this middle income trap um, is is one of their key challenges. Um, the some Chinese economists would argue that China is going to be different than than Korea or or or, or Taiwan, um, and uh, uh, and because it's a regional economy, um, it it will have more more diversity within it because it's so large, uh, because there's such a, a vast difference in 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 wealth uh, across the country that it it can still have these really advanced pockets of 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 uh, economic wealth and and tech excellence, even though um, much large swaths of the country still are, are living uh, low income lives. Um, so I'm I'm cautious about how to uh, to, to to sort of clump China together um, because China can still have power and influence in the world through these through these city centers um, and 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 some of these you know uh, hubs around Shenzhen. Uh, Hong Kong, you know, have economic sizes uh, as big as 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 Denmark and and other uh, European countries. Um, the I think you know yes, uh, politics is in command in China uh, much more uh, than even it was before uh, under Xi Jinping. Um, he has used his first ten years in power um, to really uh, weed out uh, uh, rivals. Uh, within the Communist Party, um, and this has put, uh, I think, a lot of strain on the institutions that were built up uh, before his time. Um, we are, however, entering, I think, uh, uncharted territory. Uh, we still don't know how he's now going to uh, respond to the fact that he has quite successfully weeded out his power levels, uh, and whether he will return uh, to, to sort of a more pragmatic uh, view uh, of of building up these institutions at least for for economic purposes um, and and you do hear that intellectual property rights uh, uh, are becoming uh, better defended in in Chinese courts than they used to be. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, um, that you know this this will stay the same or or all companies have the same experience. But generally speaking, from 
from surveys from European and American uh, industries, um, there is an improvement in intellectual property rights to a certain degree. Um, but moving forward, uh, you know, uh, there are still many uh, uh, unfair uh, competitive advantages that domestic companies receive uh, over their, their foreign counterparts. Um, I, I think the social credit system that you, you mentioned, um, uh, which would sort of track uh, 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 or sort of give individual citizens a, a score in China um, and according to their political behavior, their economic behavior, even their, their health um, and their well-being, we haven't seen that being rolled out to the extent that I think many were worried it would be. Um, it doesn't mean it, it won't uh, happen. Uh, COVID has allowed China to really uh, expand and tighten its, its technological surveillance of its population and mesh that with the sort of old school Communist Party means of surveillance by literally, you know, blocking uh, apartment complexes and having uh, uh, in, um, uh, watchers uh, at, at doors. So combining this very sort of physical means of surveillance and control with, with technological surveillance and control in order to sort of clamp down on COVID. And that is an apparatus that um, may or may not go away uh, 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 over time uh, and, and can be used, I think, in the future um, uh, for, for purposes uh, that go beyond uh, uh, controlling uh, infectious viruses. Well, I think we have run out of time. We're a little over our one hour uh, that we had with you, uh, Dr. Beatty. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, buy his book, read it. It's fascinating. It's very well written, very well researched, and we look forward to your next book. Thanks so much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Goodbye. All right.